Hi, my name is Dan Zeilinger, and I have been a world-traveling trad jazz musician for the past 40 years. Some of my most memorable performances were on the lawn of the Edinburgh Castle, at Imperial Palace in Japan, as well as TV shows and commercials around the world. I've met many people during my career, and have spent many hours on stage on and off with these musicians talking about jazz, life, and more. Some are touring musicians, some are theme park warriors, and some are casual musicians who play on weekends with their friends. I think they all have stories worthy of a movie script. And through these interviews, I'll be sharing them with you. Hi there, this is Dan Zeilinger with Trad Jazz Today. My next guest is somebody who, very strangely, we've run some really eerily parallel uh, musical lives in a lot of different ways. And... Uh, like I was just discussing with him uh, off camera, uh, we compete with the same work in Southern California, and all of us tuba players are kind of a brotherhood. You know, I had a chance to interview Eli Newberger, and he talked about the brotherhood of tuba players, and uh, and it's really true. Uh, anyway, this is my next uh, guest, uh, just one of the best tuba players around. Whether you want to play traditional classic jazz, classical music, or uh, bebop, is Mr. John Norieko. Hey, John. How you doing, Dan? Great I'm, to have. I'm proud of Midland. It hurts when I do this, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you get for playing sousaphone for so many years. Oh yeah. man, we we have stories. You know, one of the things I talked to uh, with other tuba players about is the brotherhood and the closeness between us comes from a lot from just the physical work. I think I think eighty percent of what we get paid is for schlepping that thing around. Yeah, I mean, uh, you you got a great point there, and and. You're one of the, uh, well, how should I put it? You're, you, you've always been a workhorse with that with that big old beast that you have. I actually, uh, I've got a 22K uh, that I've had for years and years now. And I think that's one of the reasons why I still can do that five days a week at Disney because it is a fiberglass horn, but it plays really, really well. But I don't have that kind of weight on me all the time. And, and you know how it is when you get in your 50s, man. It's just like, Holy crap! Everything starts to hurt, and you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I was in my fifties fifteen years ago, so I understand. <laughs> um, uh, and and you're right. You know, actually, I'm I'm at the point now where I'm looking, starting looking at fiberglass horns, or maybe even just uh, uh, carrying around a little bit smaller tuba. Um, but the reason I played sousaphone for so long is the visual aspect, and the fans really like it. Um, uh, uh, it's not for any good reason. I like the way my king plays. I play the, you know, I play a king now, and but it's heavier than crap. It just doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't need to be that much work, I guess. You know. Well, I I think if if one of the reasons why I think the sousaphone is so, um, what's the right word here, associated with trad jazz so much is that back in the day when this whole thing started, the new music was with a new instrument. And I really think that's kind of the way things worked out was, here's this brand new idea of this horn that you get to wear that can play all the tuba parts that aren't in front of you. Not to mention, you know, the, the debate goes on. Is it conical, is it cylindrical, is it blah, 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 all this other kind of stuff. But it has its own sound and because of its projection, it was really the right instrument for the music at the time. And you know, so new music, new horn, new this, new that, you know, and and I really think it's, it's unfortunate that the horns back then were kind of dogs and, and, and played out of tune. And those guys were working with an uphill battle. But, you know, luckily uh, for us, they got things right. And there's actually some really fine instruments out there. Oh, a absolutely. Uh, um, but of course, you know, I, the older, the old, especially the uh, suits ones in particular, uh, when you talk about the Susans from the 40s and the 50s, they were actually made for for professionals. They weren't right. just strictly college horns at the time. You, right. know, you, you look at the pictures of the big bands and even some of the orchestras from the 1930s, and you'll see a sousaphone in the back. Well, uh, I think that's why that's why Khan went with the uh, the recording bells. You know, the detachable bells, and and the and those those instruments were used. You know up until the, the mid 60s, even even the 70s, where, um, you know, if you had to sit in the back of the section, you know, you put on your recording bell and boom, you know, the sound's coming right here, as opposed to it 
going up like this. And at the time, I think a lot of that had to do with the, uh, the way things were recorded. No multi-tracks, none, none of this. Just slap up a couple ribbon mics and hope for the best, which is actually one of my, uh, my favorite ways to record, to be honest with you, is slap a couple mics up and just play dynamics. Well, I agree. I agree. Um, it, boy, that's one of that's a that's a topic that comes up often on this show uh, about um, miking and amplification and what venues and when when to do it, when not to do it. Um, of course, being a, a bass player that uh, wanted to try to make a living at it, I acquiesced to whatever the leader of the band had me do. When I was with Tenth Avenue, I strapped a mic to my bell. I had I actually had an AKG Tom Tom mount that I would hang off the top of my sousaphone bell. Because he asked me to mic for every performance, whether you know, where, no matter where we were, which I hated. But yeah, you do, well, but, but you do what you got to do. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, um, I mean, unfortunately, um, depending upon the drummer you're working with, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes the mic is definitely needed. Um, I use an old uh, uh, Sony Pro Audio uh, condenser mic that has served me really, really well over the years, and I just keep. I just like the way it sounds. Oh yeah, it's, uh, got a small, you know, footprint as far as that's concerned, and it'll clip onto any bell. And I've actually used that in studios before too, where we'll take a uh, a ribbon mic or a Neumann and put that up, and then use the clip-on mic to get the attack right, right on the front of on on the front of notes because everybody else is getting close mic and then blend those two tracks together. So if you want a little bit more attack, there you go. If you don't yeah. want a little bit more attack. So there's there's a bunch of different uh, ch choices. And I really think that's one of the things these days that um, I think a lot of people should take into consideration is is that choice aspect of things. How, you know, you're always wondering how, how do I sound? Do I sound like myself? And, and that's the goal, I think, for most musicians and especially in the trad universe um, do I sound like me? And I tell my students that all the time. Why? Why do you want to sound like me? I want to hear what you want to sound like. Right. And let's work on that because then we got some personality. Then we've got this thing. Why should I hire you if you sound just like this guy? Gosh, you know that, that's an issue that comes up in almost every venue of uh, entertainment society about the the juxtaposition between people who have an, uh, a singular identity as opposed to somebody who sounds like everybody else. Isn't that right. a discussion that goes on everywhere? Well, I think it's really prevalent, especially in the, in the trad scene, because there's a lot of guys out there, um, and I don't want to knock anybody as far as that's concerned, but you know, there was only one Bix, and you can try your hardest. <laughs> but you're not going to be Bix. And where should you? Right, yeah, and, well, and that's the other thing is why should you, right? The same thing is with Pops. I mean, a lot of guys cop his thing and stuff like that, and it's really great and everything, but I'm sorry, there's just going to be one Pops, and that's the way it is. So, I mean, a lot of times I'd rather, I think uh, um, Randy Sankey has really bridged that gap where he can do all kinds of really just – he can do Bix, but it sounds like Randy. He can do Pops, but sure. it sounds like Randy. He can do whoever you want, and it sounds like Randy. It's just got that spin on it. And and I, kudos to him because, first of all, wonderful musician, wonderful player. And uh, actually, I got turned on with him. Um, I kind of knew who he was, but working with Barrett, uh, you know, they're good friends. And he says, you got to check this guy out if you haven't heard him. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. So, and yeah. Holy crap! You know, it's just just unbelievable musicianship and and beautiful playing. It, it's funny that you talked about um, the, the personality issue. When I have young jazz uh, students, let's say a young jazz tuba player, for example, and they want to know they, how do you, they go, how do you get your ideas for soloing? I go, the first thing I do is I don't listen to other tuba players. That's not where my ideas come from, uh, because I'll, I'll end up sounding like an, another tuba player. Well, but, I mean, but if we're going to steal, know. let's steal from another instrument. <laughs> well, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I mean, you've got a couple of years on me, but both of us coming up, we really didn't have a whole lot of guys to listen to. Right. And and my take on on at least in the trad universe, um, my take on that has always been, um, well, why not? Why 
can't I do that? Why, why shouldn't I explore that kind of stuff? Um, you know, a lot of people always ask me, he says, well, you make it sound just like a bass. And, and I'm going, well, yeah, it's supposed to sound like a bass, first of all. I, I get the same comment. Yeah, yeah, and second of all is the only reason that, and the tuba was the first jazz bass, right? So it was, yeah, I mean. Right, bass players were sounding, trying to sound like us. <laughs> right, yeah, so King Oliver had the idea of this sound in his head going, no, this is, this is the way it's supposed to be, man. And, um, you know, I've been very fortunate to study with a lot of different bass players throughout throughout the decades, and um, the evolution. I think we can do stuff that they can't do, and and I think that's just a question of figuring out how to get through that maze, as far as that's concerned. Um, like you mentioned before, I love to play bebop, and I do a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, I, I I really try to embrace jazz from the beginning to now, because I think it's very important to have that basis. Um, I don't think I would be as good of a musician if I didn't have the histrionics behind that, playing those tunes. Um, you know, luckily um, at the park, you know, I'm in my 36th year there. And um, when we started there, this was the Strutters. And, and we were kind of, you know, hot, you know, young 20 somethings that were playing trad jazz, but we always had this idea about kind of souping it up a little bit, bringing it a little bit forward, play the old stuff, play the, you know, that type of thing, but give it a, a, mo a more modern spin on things. I remember well, yes. And, you know, and some folks, you know, like that, some folks don't, and, you know, and that's fine. But um, I've kind of kept that trajectory going throughout my career, trying to figure out, well, what's next? How can I, build upon that how can i you know play more different things and, and keep and keep swinging hard yeah which is which is i think the, the most important thing that that most people players don't think about in this idiom is um is are you really swinging hard man you know you know there's a lot of up and down and kind of stuff and if that's what you're looking for that's fine but it just doesn't swing as hard as maybe it should sure before we get too far along, I, I want to go back to the very your very beginnings. If you've seen my show, you know that I kind of like to talk people through their musical lives and, uh, and find out where their where the bases the beginnings were in things. Um, and so you're originally from Illinois, correct? South side of Chicago. Yeah, yeah. Tough, tough, tough boy. Uh, how old were you when you actually left Chicago? Now, is that to go to college? Uh, no, actually, I went to art school. Um, when I was uh, 16. Uh, I went to the, uh, I finished high school at the Interlochen Arts Academy. Okay. Um, I, got a, I got a scholarship. Yeah, my, I, I've been very fortunate. Um, my first instrument was actually accordion when I was five years old. Um, and as believe a story- it, Believe it or not, accordion was the first instrument for Jim Mayhack too. No shit, really? Yeah. That's great. Yeah, and as the story goes, um, I learned to, write music and English at the same time. Um, Cause that was back back in the day. And my father, my father's a scientist or was a scientist. He's, he's passed recently, but um, he played gigs on the weekends and did musical theater and stuff. So music was always in the house. Um, when I was 13, about 13, 14, I, uh, I won the audition of the Chicago Youth Symphony. And that kind of started my trajectory as far as wanting to do this for a living. And that's how I got into Interlochen was they heard me play. And, and when I was in high school, I was always in the jazz band. I also sing too. So I was always in the choirs and stuff. I was vocalist with the studio orchestra at Interlochen and blah, 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 blah. And then uh, <laughs> my, my, my mentor, Dan Parentoni, um, I started taking lessons with him in the summer when I was about 14. And uh, when I went to college, he said, you're coming here. So I went to the University of Illinois my first year at Champaign-Urbana. And second semester, he decided that he was going to move to Arizona State and take the, uh, the tuba position there and kind of build a new program. And he asked me if I wanted to go with him. So uh, I said, well, what does that mean? He says, 
well, you don't have to pay for school and you know, you come in and play in the orchestra and you can do whatever you want. And I'm going, oh. <laughs> uh, hard decision. Yeah. Yeah. You got a deal. And I wasn't in, you know, central Illinois anymore, which one of my favorite stories was, uh, I was trying to get to rehearsal one day and I, I went to my dorm and there was a, uh, six foot snow drift in front of the door that, so we had to get dug out. Nobody could leave the dorm. Um, so, Arizona, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm down. <laughs> I, think, I think you'd be surprised by how many of the interviews that I've done, uh, and that story comes up. Uh, one day they were shoveling the snow off of their car, and they said, you know, Southern California, or you know, Arizona, or at least five of the interviews I've done are East, East Coast transplants because of the snow. Yeah, it's just um, after, after that many years, I, I, I've had enough, and... If you live in Arizona long enough, your blood boils, so there's no going back. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but uh, that's that's really where um, when I was in when I was in public high school, I, I had a great assistant band director who uh, tasked me to start learning tunes. And my father had a really great record collection, so um, and he was quite a bit of a jazz aficionado and. So I, I, these tunes, and come to find out, I'm kind of photographic with music. So if I see it and hear it, I kind of know it. So it's really, you know, kind of great, uh, and it's not great. Because um, <laughs> then all of a sudden, especially at this, at, at 57 now, I've got, you know, a thousand tunes running around in my head and going, all right, which tune is that? Which bridge is that? Anyway, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, but... Um, Wait a minute. I got I to gotta say, there, there's nothing in some ways more fun and more frustrating than to be in the middle of a set and have somebody play the wrong bridge and you just go with it because you're thinking yeah, well, okay that's right you know yeah 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 i mean it's happened it's happened to me many, <laughs> many times and uh all of a sudden it's like oh yeah that's not no <laughs> <laughs> and then the whole band ends the wrong tune it's always wonderful right. But uh, I started learning tunes when I was like, you know, 14, 15, and um, my teachers at the time were really um, adamant about not only learning the song, but also learning how to sing the songs too, and learning the lyrics and stuff like that. So when, when I got to Arizona State, um, that was in 82, um, I met these guys who wanted to start a Dixie band that wanted to do this thing and it was about a year and a half later so it was probably like late 83 something like that um and then they asked me to join the band and we were playing these tunes and it's like oh i know that tune okay cool oh i know that tune cool 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 and they kind of liked my approach because my mentor teacher also plays jazz too and he's he's pretty well accomplished jazz player but he's not really a rhythm rhythm section guy he's more of a soloist and that was my take too, because I was I started thinking about stuff going, you know, sit in the orchestra, 64, 65, 66, low D, one, two. You know, there's I mean, it's a different kind of playing. And and I always wanted to play a lot. And that's one thing that this idiom really allowed me to do was was to play a lot. So when the strutters got together, um, in 84, we won this De Dixie competition that used to be out by Southern Comfort, right? And I think you actually participated in one of those well. Well, uh, myself and Dan Barrett and Brian Shaw were all part of the very, of the very first one in, right. 19, in 1980. Um, by the way, I, I, I earlier, a couple of weeks ago, I interviewed Greg uh, Varlata. So, huh. so, uh, so yeah, that, that band was organized just for that competition originally, right? Yeah, for the most part, but... Um, Ours too, yeah. Yeah, for the most part, but um, we also were doing, you know, little gigs here and sure. there because the Verdes were very entrepreneurial even then. Um, go well, figure. I tell, I tell my tuba students, I'm sorry to interrupt, I tell my tuba students that if you really want to make money playing the tuba, you really need to learn how to do a casual, a jazz casual. There's only one per symphony, and there's, you know, very few that get to do the studio work, but if you really want to make a living on tuba, you need to learn the tunes. Oh, abs you're, you're absolutely right, Dan. Um, you know, gigging is the core to our business. 
And those of us who get to do studio work, I, I mean, I feel I'm very fortunate that I get to do that. Um, but the day in, day out stuff, booking work, making sure that you can do the work. And then once again, not making sure you know the material. So there's, you know, a bunch of different stuff. Um, I've got a couple of students right now who are, um, one of them, she's running her own brass band and that's a really good thing. I've got another student out in, uh, in New Jersey who's doing the same type of thing and he's working quite a bit. So, you know, it's not just about, you can take the whole, what you've learned in the trad jazz thing and then apply that in a lot of different places. And I think the more styles that you can play, the more work you get. Um, unfortunately, um, with this whole thing that's been going on, a lot of guys are really scrambling for work the last seven months, eight months or so, because yep. they're just not there. Um, well, just to finish up, so in 85, we went out, the starters went out to Disney because um, Stan Freeze actually asked us to come out and audition. They liked us. So in January of 85, I started working there five days a week playing tunes. Yep. And, yeah. And, and it's been that way. Um, now it's the Jambalaya Jazz Band. And uh, the starters were there for 23 years. Then the company decided to do something else. Luckily, I made the cut. And so for the last 13 years or so, uh, it's been the Jambalaya Jazz Band. And that's been great because Rusty Styers has been leading it, who's a wonderful musician, great player, and a fantastic arranger. Well, you know, so, Rusty, R Rusty has at least told me that, that he's now retired. Um, I was trying to get him to do an interview, an interview for the show. Of course, he and I spent six, six years together at Knott's Berry Farm. Oh, I know. And, and all this other stuff. Uh, yeah, he's a wonderful guy and an incredible musician. So, yeah, I don't think he's retired, Dan. <laughs> well, that's what he told me. He told me, he told me that he had stopped playing and he's going to be a day trader. Yeah, well, he's he's definitely well, very, very, very good at being a day trader. But I got a, <laughs> I got a feeling he's just retired for now. Yeah, I, I understand. You know, but uh, um, I really think, uh, at least for me. Um, Disney's provided me with uh, a really great base where I could say no to stuff that I didn't necessarily want to do. Um, it's also been a great place to keep my chops up because you're there, you know, seven, eight hours a day, doing seven sets a day. Um, we go through about 30, 35 tunes a day. Uh, we don't repeat tunes. Well, when you, yeah, when you've got Rusty leaving it, uh, you don't do the same 12 tunes every day. No, no, I'm, and we're tasked to do some Disney stuff, but um, the upside is I think one time we didn't repeat a tune for three days. Oh, yeah. So, you know, there's there's over 100 tunes right there, and and I just, it's so healthy. It's so healthy. No, no truly it is. Because no, I know. There's a great exploration with that, too. And we were just talking about playing the wrong bridge, or playing the wrong A section with the right bridge or whatever, or the melodies. And and when you're doing, when you've got those many tunes rolling around in your head, you're going, all right, so what key are we in again? Oh yeah, that's that. And oh yeah, does the bridge go to the four chord? Oh yeah, that, okay, cool. Um, because it's really similar to the one you just played <laughs> and, or the one you played yesterday going, did we play that yesterday? No, it's this tune instead, but really, really similar. So, um, I think it's it's I like I like the gig. I think after all this stuff is hopefully we're going to get called back real soon here. And uh, I have a feeling that a lot of the guys, myself included, are going to look at this a little bit differently coming back. Um, and I think all of us need to really, really think about what we do differently once we're able to play out again, because this is special. Being able to do that and to play in front of people, to entertain them, to to play music that they want to hear, that's just special. It, it truly is. Uh, it, it, uh, I, I absolutely agree. You may have heard on uh, some of the other shows I talked about the fact that I, I explained to my students that want to become professionals. I, I think that our calling is that musicians are actually kind of doctors of the soul. 
uh, what I like doing on stage is lifting the burden off of their shoulders for that moment or for that hour. Right. Yeah. And and I think a lot, once you once you're doing it every day, uh, six hours a day or four hours a day, sometimes you lose sight of the perspective. True, it becomes you know if if you, you can't think of it as a grind, you can't think of it because you chose this, and that's what I tell my kids and and my students a lot. I said, well, you said yes, so <laughs> you know. You know, make a decision, man. You said yes. So right. You don't like it. Right. That's, That's my same approach to a gig. I say, yeah. if you take, if you take a gig, you do what you're asked, and and to do your best. And if you don't like it, don't do it again. Yeah, but while you're but, but while you're on the gig, do the gig. Do the gig. Yeah, and that's um. I think some of the younger generation these days, um, they tend to depending upon the gig, they don't take it as seriously as maybe they should. And, you know, that's one thing. Uh, one of my big pet peeves is talking on stage, especially when somebody else is blowing a chorus. You know, I just find that to be so rude. It's just like, you know, do you want, do you want me to talk during your chorus? Because I'll drop out and have a conversation with the drummer, and then you can just go ahead and play. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the show business part of what we do. Uh, it took me a long time to learn it. Actually, I learned it from Doug Maddox. Uh, when I when I started with Banjo Mania awesome. originally, yeah. uh, I, he he talked to me about directing attention on stage and that, how everything is part of the picture. Um, up until then, I had been playing for 20 years up until I got that gig. And nobody had ever talked to me about stage presence and directing attention and your job is to focus the audience uh, so yeah, but all those things are things that, that aren't taught. They aren't taught at school. They aren't taught by teachers. They aren't taught in college. You know, which is totally unfortunate because um, I've got a couple of friends who teach um, classes now in basically musical entrepreneurship and stuff like that. And part of those classes are professionalism and 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 how you how you come off to the audience makes a big deal it's it's a big deal you should be if you're up there in front of people you should be a pro all the time and you know i'm sorry but some of that has to do with showing up on time and stuff like that um i mean my mantra is always early is on time on time is late and late is unacceptable and that's just the way it is especially if you want to get called again yes you know and and my kids know this, and, and that's one of the reasons why my son is becoming rather successful, because he's early all the time, you know? Oh. And if you're early, you know, guess what? Then if you forgot something, you can always have time to go get it, right? Yeah. I mean, but if you're showing up five minutes before the downbeat, I don't know, man, It's, it's it, it kind of bugs me sometimes. I mean, I get it, it's for some people, but it's just a, kind of a lack of professionalism. And it doesn't matter what the gig pays, it's still a gig. I have a similar story uh, about my son. My son, right out of high school, got a gig at got the gig at Medieval Times as one of the fanfare players. Oh, cool! And and and, uh, and he immediately within within the first two weeks, he was asked to lead, uh, be the the head guy because even the older trumpet players who were already there weren't professional. They weren't on time. They weren't dressed correctly. They were complaining, and and he had enough of that beat into his by his dad and by drum and bugle corps actually that uh, he knew how to follow orders and do his gig. And you're right. I mean, that's something that you don't find in the younger generation a lot. Yeah, you know, it's, the other thing too is I don't, it's work. Now, it doesn't matter. And, and uh, one of my, my good friends says, you know, when it comes to musicians, especially being pros, we're no different than being a plumber or an electrician, right? It's a trade that we've learned and we apply this trade. And, and, and I think, you can go out and, and hire a crappy electrician and watch your house burn out, or you can go out and get a good one. Well, the same thing is true with musicians. You can hire really good musicians, and then it's going to be great, or you can hire bad ones who show up late and don't have their shit together and blah, 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 and all this other kind of stuff. So um, I just, you know, I wish people would just grasp that concept a little <laughs> bit better. Sure. Because it, and, and especially, it just it, it makes such a big difference. Um, 
and now now that we're the old guys uh, <laughs> when you're playing oh can you wrap your head around that i mean i'm I know, it's so i'm a weird. i'm a grandfather three times now yeah, and so, it's so it's, bizarre it, no it's bizarre but totally awesome to do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah i just uh it's it's a level of professionalism that that both of us learned from the from the old guys so once again it's that whole trade aspect where you go in and you apprentice and you say, no, this is the way it's done. This is the way it is. And if you look at the people who have been, who have embraced those concepts, they're the ones working all the time. Sure. So it's not BS, man. I mean, it's, it's, it's the real deal. Now, along, along the same lines, if the general public would understand that nobody ever says, we're having a party, bring your wrenches, we'll fix some sinks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No, I think I think what bothers me about that is is that um, is all it'll, the be time, good, it'll be good for your exposure as a plumber. Yeah, yeah. Well, see, the the, the exposure words should never be used. <laughs> but um, I think because entertainment is so readily available these days that uh, people balk at what you charge. Really, that much? Well, yeah. Um, you can get those guys for you know a couple hundred bucks less, but you know you get what you pay for, and and unfortunately, you know people we live in such a disposable universe now that um, even music is becoming disposable, and it shouldn't be. And yeah. live music, live music, should never be looked at that at, at that way, in my opinion. Well, one of the strange things about what we do, John, is that if you do it well, if you really the best at what you do. It looks easy and it looks fun, and no. people can't wrap their head around with that being also being difficult, and that how many hours you spend on your horn in the living room or in your bedroom practicing, people can't relate what we do on stage when they see us and the work it took to get there. Right. Yeah. Well, I think I think when it looks easy, those are the guys I want to play with because those guys. No, seriously. They, if it looks easy, then they put the time in. And you know, and as soon as you hear them, like, you know, when I see somebody pull up their trumpet and nothing happens here and this beautiful sound comes out and you look at them, they're not working, not doing, they've put their time in, you know, and so it's going to be awesome, just awesome time. And, and I would like to think that everybody goes to their job to have a little bit of fun. Right? You would, think, you, would, you would hope it makes, makes life worth living. Right. I mean, so shouldn't your job be fun to show up and do every day? So, yeah. But, you know, good stuff costs. So, you know, I just, I mean, I'm still doing $50 jazz gigs, Dan. I mean, it's been, you know, you know what I'm saying? 20 years of the same bread, you know, and, and, and I do them because of the guys that I get to play with and the music I get to play. It's not really about the money so much, but come on, it, it's it's becoming kind of insulting. You know, you know, the Jambalaya Jazz Band is a great example of of exactly what we're talking about. The last few times I've been to the park and, and wandered by to see the band, mm -hmm. it, it just amazes me that I know that the people who are standing in front of you, the fans that come from, from Japan or, or from across the country to Disneyland for the very first time, and they see, see the band, it looks effortless. What what you guys do at the park looks looks and it should looks effortless. And Rusty's so smooth with uh, when he was uh, doing MCing and how transitions happen from one to to another. And you guys are offering each other the stage and we're gonna have a tune that it just looks it looks completely just. I think anybody would kill to have a job that went that way every day. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean no, I'm just I, talking about from the outside appearances. No, 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 and you're absolutely correct. Um, I mean, I will say it. I've got one of the best, last best jobs for playing music. I mean, that that kind of a job is, is going away, and luckily the company is keeping us around. And, um, you know, we just went through a whole scene of layoffs and stuff like that um, because of the scene and everything. And luckily, um, they kept all us old guys and, and and I will say, I'm, I'm very fortunate to play with some of the best players in L.A. every day. Yeah. Um, I got to tell you, John, it still freaks me out when you refer, refer yourself as an old guy. 
because uh, I remember I remember when you guys walked in on the miners and they had just uh, gotten the boot and you were the new punks in town. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it just speaks to how old I am, but it, it's really it's really kind of mind boggling, John. I just got to tell you. <laughs> No, it, it, tr it truly is. Um, you know, I, I, I look back and, and I'm going, so how the hell did I end up here? <laughs> and, and that's really, really what, uh, especially since uh, last night, um, I don't know if you know this, but um, my, my group, Tuba. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm subscribed, by the way. Oh, oh, thank you, man. I really appreciate that. But we just did our uh, 23rd concert last night. We've been doing them every Friday night. Um, luckily, um, I've got enough room here in my living room where everybody's distance and we wear masks in the house when we're not playing. And um, But the guys come over and, uh, and that's really where we all get to stretch a little bit. It, and it was all born out of, um, I had this, uh, this gig of Steady and Whittier um, at Crepes and Grapes. It's a French restaurant there, a little, little Thing. And uh, Ed Velasco, myself, and Matt, Mark Massey were doing that as a trio for about a year and a half. And then we decided to uh, take a little cut and pay and get a drummer to come in and play small, small little cocktail kit. And that really kind of sent us over, the, you know, the edge as far as music was concerned. Because now it was just a couple hours. Um, they loved having us on Friday nights. And we were doing it every Friday night for about two and a half years before this whole thing started. And man, I'll tell you what, it was just like, I looked forward to that gig every week because, you know, doing the park five days a week, get to play that stuff, that's well and good. But then I get to kind of vent my head out on a Friday night over here, which is really great. And um, I just didn't want that to stop. So that's why I started doing these two bop live things. and. Um, as you know, as, as having a tech son, um, <laughs> you know, uh, and he's our producer. My son is is, hit, is the producer for us. Um, he uh, he just stepped up, man. And and for me, uh, I couldn't be more more proud, Dad. First of all, but also uh, what an opportunity just to play stuff. We've done themed nights. We've played some really interesting stuff. It's been uh, it's been really fun to be honest with you. And um, this last couple of weeks, we had to take a little time off, um, long story, but uh, but now we're back and uh, I can't wait till next week, to be honest with you. Oh, that's great. Uh, I really envy uh, you having that venue in that um, I don't have a I don't have an outlet for my busier, more bo modern playing. If you, uh, I, have, uh, I have my uh, music channel on YouTube, uh, Dan Daniel E. Zeilinger. That uh -huh. I have a lot of my releases from, and uh, I got to play a quartet album with the Pat Deneen a banjo player, and we were actually doing some, you know, uh, we were doing some Django and we were doing some Charlie Parker and some stuff on that, where I really had a chance to to play more of that style, more of the kind of stuff that you get to play every Friday night, and uh, for me to, I I just don't have that venue anymore to. Uh, you know, if I play it's, those, if I play those kind of lines with the Dixieland bands I play with, I, I'd get kicked out. So. Yeah, well, you know, once again, it goes back to what we were talking about before. Always play the gig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to be doing a bunch of substitutions behind that. No, I'm just going to, you know, and, and besides, and, and you know what, you bring up a really good point too. Um, there are, when I listen to. Um, to a lot of younger players and, and, and actually a lot of bands these days, uh, two things strike me as, as as interesting. And one are the guys who um, don't play tuba all the time. And I really wish, and they got a great feel and they, they know the music and stuff, but I really wish they would work more on their fundamentals because um, I look at them play and I hear them play and it's like, you're working so hard you're doing this wrong and if you would just do this you could play a lot longer and, and sound a lot better and i don't know man it's just you know it's, it's kind of like teaching a dog new tricks and stuff but i know, think we, i think we need a tuba union is what we need we need well you know <laughs> I, I you know in this day and age it's you know you got a question you know email me you know let me know i, I have no problem you know um, 
In fact, I'm doing a, a couple of students uh, at USC who are interested in jazz and uh, want to start learning because they don't take them seriously in college. So and I'm kind of doing that pro bono because if they show initiative, then yeah, it's worth my time. Well, there's got to be somebody good out there to replace us, don't you think? Well, yeah, and you know that's the other thing too. <laughs> um, you know, we once again um, having an apprentice is a good thing. Um, mentoring is a good thing, especially in this idiom. Um, they don't know. In most colleges, jazz started in the you know mid fifties. Right. Well, you talk about you talk about old time jazz, and, and at the earliest they talk about Clifford. It's sort of right, and that, that, that's old. As opposed to let's let's talk about Bix, right, and and how he really changed the landscape, and let's talk about all these other guys. What what one thing that that's been really kind of interesting for me is is that cusp where the bands got bigger, but you had guys playing straight and swing at the same time in the section. And and it worked, and it, and it gave it a very unique sound and how that worked, and how that was the springboard to get us to the next thing. And and to be honest with you, everybody should know this. I mean, that way you can, you can actually say, well, no, that's valid. And if I'm going to cop that, just because, because there's a great deal of information there that you can get out of that and still use. Sure. And that's that's a really interesting thing about it. Um, just like there's guys out there who say, no, we don't play Chicago style jazz. Well, okay. Uh, <laughs> you're not going to make any. You're not going to make it as much money as you could then either, are you? No, no. But I mean, it's it's the whole three horn, four horn front thing, right? Yeah. You know, or five horns for that matter. Sure. I mean, you, as everything got bigger, but um, I get it, and sure, yeah. But then you've just cut yourself off of this a plethora of more information that you can do. Uh, once again, I uh, um, I view music as this big pie, and and each has got a section. And and as as a life learner, um, I'm I want to know that whole pie, and and that's one of the reasons why music is still near and dear to my heart and fascinating to me is that it, I'm never going to know it all. And that's so exciting to me. Especially when you consider that there are only shades of 12 notes. You know, I mean, the fact that we have that many combinations and styles and feelings and uh, international traditions, music is just a wonderful thing for that. Are you still at Saddleback, by the way? Um, I haven't had a I haven't had any students for a couple of semesters. That's kind of like I'm doing. I'm an adjunct there, so it's whoever signs up if they're willing to deal with me. Um, and they really haven't had any. Uh, well, I'm just I just wanted to say that anybody who has you as a teacher, uh, is, I'm, I'm envious of. It's it's a wonderful. Oh, thank you very much. It's a wonderful thing. When I I, I just retired from teaching. Um, that kind of situation. I was in high schools for a long time. I just. In March, I, I just decided to go ahead and retire. But on my jazz programs, I used to start kids off the of lead sheets, and they would learn, you know, a Bourbon Street Parade, and we would go all the way through all the modern big band charts. But I wanted to give them the foundations to what it was they were doing. And we really need to find a way to get that instituted into the public school system. Absolutely. I mean, everybody should start. I mean, lead sheets of... 1917 start there right i mean you know first one one of the first tunes i mean liver stable blues right first tune ever recorded really right yep let's start there and go because after that there's a logical progression of how things evolved and how we viewed things and how the sounds changed and how the harmony changed and everything and the ideas too the ideas is the really interesting thing about that is that there are guys who said no i really like these and those guys say i like those and i'm just going to keep going more and then those guys said oh that's pretty cool and then this and then, i mean it's it's too bad i mean a lot of people don't realize that the, the whole bebop era started on contrafacts right you know you know they were just melt contrafacts of of dixie tunes that those guys the changes that guys like to play over and why? Okay, they're good changes. <laughs> so, yeah. 
I always like, I always like to see the frightening look in people's eyes when we're playing Indiana and I do that opening lift from Donna Lee. There you and, go. And, yeah. and then the entire front line turns around and gets, shoots that glaze at me, you know. I go, okay, ah. okay, fine, fine. Ah. <laughs> no, but I... I... I, I, I can't remember. This was a couple of years ago, and I was uh, I was talking to this kid. He was in his 20s, and I'm going, well, do you know this tune? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's just a standard. And I said, well, you know where the tune comes from? And he goes, no. And I said, well, it's this and this tune. It was written actually in 1928, and, you know, they just use the same changes, and then the melody is a contrafact on top of that. And he goes, what's a contrafact? <laughs> I said, did you go to school? Uh, <laughs> take theory. Uh, Have you played the Tom Kubis chart? Oh, yeah. Well, think, <laughs> but but speaking of that, I think uh, that's one of the things that a lot of folks um, who are doing this run up against a wall. They haven't had the time or the inclination to figure out why it works the way it does. And I've always been trying to investigate why melody works the way it does why harmony works the way it does and i think that's made me a better bass player or you know because i don't play bass i play tuba but why does it always do that and i tell my students now they're going so what are you listening for and i'm going well i'm listening for threes and sevens you know because that's going to tell me where i'm going next even if i don't know the tune it's going to be that and most soloists are going to give you that so if you're listening for the right stuff and then I had one go, what, what's a three and a seven? I'm going, oh, really? Um, <laughs> yeah. We're, we're, okay, where do we start? I know. Yeah. And then, um, and then the other thing, too, and I'm sure you've run into this, Dan, is, well, where do you come up with your ideas to construct bass lines? Well, you know, we can have a very long and in-depth, you know, eight-hour conversation about this. But the real thing is these. Yeah, right. One of the things I used to do when I was coming up is, is if I was waiting, say I was in – a freshman or a sophomore in high school, I'd be waiting for somebody to come pick me up for a ride somewhere. I I would be sing, I would be listening to a twelve bar blues in my head, and trying to figure out ways to get around. On I don't know why, because I wasn't playing bass at the time. But I know in junior high we played a tune called Fidgets. That was nothing yeah. but just outlining uh, a twelve bar blues, uh, a la, in the mood. And so I had from the very beginnings I had that in my head. I would just think of a blues in my head and try to fit lines over it. But I want to correct something you said. You are a bass player. You just happen to play tuba. Yeah, well, you know, that's, you know. Semantics. Yes, semantics. <laughs> yeah, but, but I want the public to understand that we are bass players. Yeah, no, and we are. We're, we're the, like I said before, we're the original jazz bass players because it's the original jazz bass. Um, and I really, and that's one thing that also bugs me too when I'm, I go and play clubs and, and whatnot, and I show up and the club owner goes, what, we having a polka band tonight? And I'm going, well, you could, but no, <laughs> we're gonna be playing some of that shit. And he's going, well, I don't understand. And then I get done with the first set and he goes, can I buy you a drink? And I said, well, I don't drink and play anymore, so you can buy me one when I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> a wise decision, lad. No, it's, 25 years on that, man. I was, I was thinking the other day about the fact that, that I was up on a Dixieland stage probably a couple of years ago, and I looked down and everybody had a Diet Coke next to the stand. I was thinking, God, things changed, you know? Yeah, things have changed, my brother. <laughs> <Just that. laughs> I remember when the, the guys used to have uh, cup holders on their stands for their beers. and I know. And it's but so funny. There's some, there's some out there who keep in the faith, and that's just fine by me, but I just don't... Um, I don't like the way uh, my face feels or how I, <laughs> no, how I feel while I'm playing. And, and that's kind of why I stopped, was that I felt my tongue wasn't quick enough. I felt it was kind of, a, you know, this swollen thing, um, blah, 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 blah. And, but I'll tell you what, when I'm done, bring on the beer, baby. <laughs> hey, hey, John, it's funny, it's great to finally get to know you. Um, I hope, I hope we have, uh, cause for further conversations in our lives i'm i'm going to kind of have to wrap up our interview um right well, now but uh thank you oh my my absolute pleasure and thank you for the invitation dan yeah i'm looking um, for, i'm looking forward to uh our collaboration here coming up for christmas yeah which by the way i was going to send you the file yesterday we had a little bit of technical issues so we had to straighten those out 
but I'm gonna get that file done for you tomorrow and send it out. No problem. I've got you and Joe Jackson on the on the base part, so that ought to be fun. You couldn't get anybody else, huh? No, I couldn't find anybody good. Uh, yeah. I think John Van Houten was busy at the time. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. But uh, uh, jo Joe's a great player, man. Oh, he's and he's just such a nice guy. Makes you want to hit him. <laughs> absolute sweetheart. Absolute sweetheart. All right, John. You take care now, and please let's uh, find a reason to talk again soon. I would love that very much, Danny, and thank you so much for the time. You're welcome. Take care. All right. And two, uh, and two bop forever, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching Trad Jazz today. Dan shows new interviews every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Make sure to check out the archive of past shows, and please give us a thumbs up when you subscribe to the channel. Bye.